In this episode, I am speaking with entrepreneur, investor, and podcast host, Nick Telson. Nick has an incredible background from launching startups to selling companies and even advising others on how they can do the same. I filmed hundreds of discussions on this podcast and I can easily say that this episode is one of my all time favorites. Welcome back to the podcast. The Alfie Wattam Podcast. I saw Pitch Deck and I saw the stuff that you were putting on LinkedIn and, and other platforms and I thought it was really, really cool. In, in preparation of this, I actually listened back to your first ever episode of, of Pitch Deck with our, our mutual friend, uh, Dan Marie Serta, when he mm-hmm. was pitching Heights. Yeah. And it's, it's incredible to see like companies like that that were pitching perhaps in the earlier days and now they're doing really, really successful. And your podcast is a little bit different to most in that it's a collection of stories and experiences with companies that have some have scaled and become really successful. Some probably don't exist anymore. You know, that's the world of investing, right? But just tell us a little bit more about Pitch Deck. Tell us a little bit more about the podcast. Yeah, so uh, the idea from the podcast was, you know, you've got Dragon's Den um, and Shark Tank and those things in America, uh, which are great, great entertainment. But, you know, that's not the reality of especially pre-seed and seed investing. Um, So, you know, on the one hand, I had a good community of founders that I knew I was investing myself as well. Um, So I was seeing plenty of actual pitch decks um, and seeing some very bad pitches, some very good pitches. And then on the other hand, I had a good angel network. So I thought, okay, let's let's bring these two together and actually just open up the door on what uh, a sort of angel pitch looks like. Um, Very honest, very raw, um, you know, very lightly edited, um, so it is what it is. Um, and then, you know, I, I always said to the founders that came on it, you're going to get honest questions and feedback from the angel as you would in a normal, not filmed pitch. So yeah. you've got to be ready for some criticism as well. Um, and I think that's what really, really resonated with people that listen to it is it's, it's the honest truth of pitching an angel and, you know, the good founders will listen to them and listen to all the different types of angels I have on the podcast and see what they look for, what they like, what makes a good pitch for them. And then hopefully that prepares founders better when they're ready to pitch angels. You've you mentioned there about investing, and you've invested in in quite a few companies, haven't you? You've got uh, is it ho- horseplay, horseplay ventures? Horseplay ventures, yeah. This, this is your um, trumpet and horseplay, kind of your two primary focuses right now. Yeah, so horseplay is is just an angel investing arm, but with me and my co-founder Andrew from Design My Night, um, we've invested in around fifty five startups cool. across the world um, since two thousand and. 18, 19. Um, so a lot. Um, we've learned some lessons as well as investors, uh, as you do as a founder. Um, and yeah, it's just brilliant to be privy to so many different types of founders, so many different types of startups. And our motto is just to help. Like we've, we've been there, we've done it, and we're back there again with Trumpet. So, you know, we can really help founders. We understand what it does take to be a founder. You've invested in quite a few different types of companies um one of them i actually featured on the podcast before um this will give you a little memory jog here and um, you won't have seen this but this is cafe x one of the u.s ventures that yes. you've done um and we we had a debate where we were talking about the future of jobs and automation and and companies and industries being replaced whether that's a barista or the knock-on effect that could have on starbucks and or, or something like mm-hmm. that right um and we had different tech experts debate the the pros and cons of a company like like cafe x mm-hmm. um it doesn't have to be that that particular one because that's just a random one that we've cherry picked but what what is it that nick looks for when when investing you must get a lot of pitches because of the podcast because of the social media stuff that you're doing what what makes you say yes to somebody so i'm very founder driven which you'll hear a lot of investors say um but you know i've turned down what i think good ideas if i don't think the founder has what it takes um so i'm very very founder led um i like to really hear the experience of the founder and what led them to set up this startup you know what experiences give you that determination and that drive um what are you doing this for um you know more sort of meta questions rather than just about the business um because more than half of the time it's the founder that loses their way or can't cope with it rather than the idea not being a great one um i'm pretty sector agnostic i just have to understand it yeah. um so obviously my background I'm, I'm very sort of brand marketing um design my night was SaaS and b2c and marketplace so that covers quite a lot trumpet is um SaaS. 
B2B SaaS. So I, I tend to invest in what I understand, but you know, like Cafe X, for example, I don't understand robotics, but sure. I understood the business and what they were trying to do. Um, so, you know, sort of like deep tech and med tech and stuff like that, which goes a bit over my head um, because it's not my full-time job. I don't really have the time to go and do deep research on every topic. So it's yeah, more... Yeah. Do I just get what you're trying to do? Does the business make sense to me? It's quite important. Yeah, I think Warren Buffett calls it his circle of competence when it when investing, and he, he does not go outside of that but because that's when you know he doesn't know what he's doing. He's gambling, basically. Is is that, is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, I mean, look, investing is is a gamble anyway. You know, when when I exited Design My Night and um, I spoke to sort of a financial advisor um, when we were planning out you know, what I was planning to do in the future, she said, okay, your angel investing pot, I'm literally going to mark that down as zero. I'm not even going to acknowledge that you're doing that. Okay. But for me, as a financial advisor, that is pure gambling. Uh, yeah. You know, you might as well go to Vegas and put it all on red. Um, so from a financial point of view, it's so risky. So yeah, if you can, at least as you're saying, stay in that circle of competence that you know, you can help them and you can guide them because you've got that knowledge. Um, but you can also make some form of judgment if you think it's a good idea, then that stands you in good stead. If you could only do one, in, invest in people or start your own companies, which which one would you pick and, and why? A hundred percent start my own companies. Um, I think that's, that's why um, we did Trumpet. Mm. Um, Andrew and I are very fortunate that we had a very nice exit from our first startup. So we you know, we don't have to work, um, but we actually just thought to ourselves when we exited, you know, well, what what do, what do you do with your life? <laughs> uh, you know, we're still relatively young. Um, and yeah, we both decided that, look, we just love the cut and thrust of startups, ideating, yeah. growing a business, growing a team, like is a genuine passion of ours. Um, and we're in a fortunate enough position that it's a passion now rather than like it has to work, mm. uh, which actually is a much nicer position to be in as a founder, um, a lot less stressful. Um, so, yeah, a, a million percent love being in the thick of it. Yeah. You mentioned Design My Night there. And um, what's something that I found really interesting about that, that company is after you sold it, I think it was around 25 million. I don't want to um, misquote that, but you did a podcast with Dominic McGregor and you said that selling it, was your darkest moment, which I thought was super interesting because most people, if they sell a company for 25 million circa, they don't have that feeling. Yeah, I under I can understand and relate to that feeling, mm -hmm. but tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, what, what I say around that is, um, what I said to Dom was my identity yeah. for, for nine years was design my night. So my family, my friends, my, my business life was everything was about design my night. I woke up every morning. The first thing I would do is pick up my phone, look at Slack, look at emails. It's about design my night. Um, so it's a very, very strange scenario to wake up one morning and just have quiet. Mm. Um, it's some people's dream, but um, it was the first time I actually sat and thought to myself, what what am I going to do? Like, what what's my purpose here? Yeah. Like, what what gives me joy? What gives me happiness? Um, you know, money is great, uh, and I think money allows you to have those those thoughts of okay, look, I've got the financial freedom to to do what brings me joy and other people joy. Um, so that's the good thing about money. But just having money and buying stuff isn't doesn't give me joy at least or yeah. or, or yeah. purpose. Um, so yeah, it was it was my whole identity, my whole purpose had just disappeared overnight, literally overnight. You know, one day I was still the CEO, the next day I had nothing to do with the business. Um, so yeah, it was the first time in my life I've I've actually sat down and just asked myself those questions: that yeah. what is my purpose of being here? You, you kind of were still involved, though, right? Because uh, you were on my friend James Mitra's podcast as well, and you said that was like a turn two year earnout or something. Yeah, uh, which I don't know. Um, how you did that because like for me as a as a founder I'd, I'd, I'd feel very um unmotivated perhaps mm -hmm. maybe I shouldn't be saying that in case I do sell one day but <laughs> tell me a little bit about that two-year period were you motivated were you happy and did you feel purpose yeah I mean um it's, it's pretty standard so you know when when the exit is of a certain value um you know it's very rare that the the acquiring company is just going to let the founders disappear from day one. Yeah. Um, you know, they want that smooth transition. Um, they'd done the deal and such that we were financially motivated to, to hit targets for those two years as well. 
So I think our motivation shifted from wanting to grow a business and design my night being our baby uh, to, okay, we need to hit these targets to get the financial rewards uh, after two years. So it was, a, it was a shift in mindset, but I think Andrew and I, we're very driven people. So that became our driver then for two years was we need to hit these targets and we're going to do everything we can to hit these targets. So um, it was, a, it was a, a slight shift and it's the obvious, a big corporate coming into your startup. We had about 100 people at Design My Night at that time, pre-pandemic. So we, we were all in the office uh, at a very cool office in Hoxton in London. Um, so, yeah, a corporate coming into that um, was tough. Yeah. Um, but I think those two years was just us telling them to trust, trust us. Like sure. you've given us these targets, we will listen to you, but we run this business for seven years. Yeah. So just, just help us um, sort of try not to get in the way. Um, so you obviously get that friction, um, but they weren't too bad and we did succeed. So we all shook hands at the end, very happy. Yeah. That's a long time running, running your first company, right? And along that way is like, I guess like a first time founder, you have, um, that was your first yeah. venture, right? Yes. You have many many ups many downs i think one thing that i thought was really interesting was that you were using this outsourced seo company for like 80 percent of your traffic or something and then google made some change to the algorithm and then like instantly the floodgates were shut and you were kind of having to do anything possible to to, to find people to, to keep it going obviously you were able to overcome that obstacle and and defeat that challenge and and scale it and sell and exit most people if 80 percent of their leads vanished overnight they would think fuck what, what what do i do yeah right i think that's a real difference between an entrepreneur and somebody who perhaps should be working at a company T tell me a little bit about that type of experience yeah i mean that that's what i was talking about at the start when i look into sort of a founder's eyes before i invest and i yeah. think do you have what it takes you know because it's never smooth sailing and as you rightly say you know when some big obstacles hit someone uh the best founders will find ways out of it uh the the not so great founders uh will crumble yeah um so that for us was yeah one of the darkest moments of design my night as you say we outsourced seo this was back in like 2011 12 so it's a very different game back then and the agency yeah. we employed unbeknown to us because we didn't know about seo we're doing like as it was called black hat techniques um okay and we were top of Google for loads of things. Uh, everything was great. And then, yeah, Google changed their algorithm. I think it was one called Penguin, yeah, yeah, um, yeah, Penguin. which just tightened, uh, stopped all the black hat techniques, quite rightly so. But we had no idea that we were even doing black hat techniques. So, we, yeah, we, m most mornings we, we came in and checked our traffic uh, and it would just dropped off a cliff so we thought oh there must be a bug in analytics we'll check back later yeah uh, there wasn't um and then we started googling it and started learning about penguin um so yeah we, you know we obviously had a freak out moment that afternoon but then straight away we were like okay what do we do now let's strategize yeah. and actually what we did do uh, was teach ourselves so we learned okay look we can't trust anyone let's learn seo uh, and andrew and i yeah, sort of became sort of mini S SEO experts. I'm not saying we could start an agency, but we just taught ourselves SEO. SEO is not that complicated at the end of the day. You know, what, what Google likes is obvious. Um, so we then rebuilt. We, yeah, probably lost about a year and a half's worth of traffic to get it back. Blimey. Um, but we then built up a very solid base. And, you know, when we sold Design My Night, we're getting about 8 million uniques a month about 60 65 percent of that was uh, organic google so okay. and that's what most people say when i mention some and they're like oh every time i google something you guys are top so yeah, you yeah. know it, we did the right thing to then learn it do it ourselves bring it in-house yeah um and just do it correctly and then that paid dividends later hey this podcast is brought to you by we love alpha.com if you're looking to grow and hire and scale your software engineering team in the uk and go to welovealpha.com to hire the best software developers on the market. Everything across Java to C Sharp to PHP to Python to React and Angular and mobile and more. Go to welovealpha.com to hire the best software engineers in the UK now. What was, for the just context, I guess, what, what is Design My Night for the people that, that, that aren't aware? Yeah, so it's uh, on the one hand a discovery platform uh, for sort of going out, yeah. so restaurants, bars, pubs, um, in about 20 cities in the UK, mm. uh, biggest one obviously London, 
Um, but then we also built SaaS as well. So we built um, a reservation platform for bars and pubs. We built a ticketing platform mm. so for pop-ups to sell events and tickets. Uh, and then we also built an e-vouchering platform so bars and restaurants could sell vouchers to their venues. So um, sort of competing with, uh, you know, like to- uh, open table and time out and, you know, that whole compendium of hospitality. Okay. Um, we... Yeah, we're trying to do it all, basically. Am I right in thinking that the way that you described it just then, I guess the SaaS, the open table comparison, wasn't the initial thought though, when you when you put it together? Because you did um, kind of pivot, is that yeah. right? Yeah, so it started very much as B2C discovery. Yeah. Uh, we did that for about two and a half years, three years. And then we came across the, the, the idea of doing SaaS, yeah. um, basically an open table for bars, because um, bars aren't run like restaurants no um so very very different but they were using restaurant systems and not enjoying it so yeah we basically built a a reservation platform solely for bars um and then it was pretty easy to then get customers because every bar we took it to they were like yeah this makes total sense like it's built for us um and then we spread our wings so we started in bars then we went to pubs Mm -hmm. um and then we went into casual dining um, so that's when we started to veer into sort of open table land. Um, but that was definitely our niche. So we sort of left the higher end restaurants to the likes of open table and we focused on, we called it called sort of casual hospitality. So okay. casual dining restaurants and pubs. Um, and that really then became our driver, like SAS yeah. became what is why we exited. So you, you built that, scaled it, sold it, and then you went on to trumpets. Yeah. Okay. Tell us once again, a little bit about trumpet. So Trumpet, the idea came thinking back to Design My Night Days. So, you know, that that was our ideation process for Trumpet was let's look at all the different teams we had at Design My Night and what could have been done better. Um, and we looked at dev and, you know, dev and engineering seem to have a tool every week that they want. Um, so we're like, OK, we'll leave that as is. You had the likes of Figma and Canva and Trello. So all this stuff for like marketing and CS. And then we looked at the sales cycle and we thought, OK, well, Once you've got that lead, what you're doing is sending them a deck, like Mm -hmm. a PowerPoint or a PDF, which is technology from the 70s, literally. Yes. Um, Yes. And then to get the deal done, you know, you're going back and forward. I think the average now is 60 emails to get a deal done. Blimey. Um, And you're just going back and forward, keep providing content, pricing, back and forward, back and forward. And we're like, that has to be done in a better way. Um, So so a couple of years back, we ideated on Trumpet. It's become a bit of a thing now. So the space is called Digital Sales Rooms. Um, We like to think we were one of the first to to sort of launch that idea. And it's basically a, a collaborative space between you and the buyer where the seller can drop in everything they need into one link, which is online. And it can be proposals and costs and use cases and case studies and demos and video and audio, but all in one space that the buyer can collaborate with. Uh, they can see all the information. They can then send that link to get internal sign off because all the content is in one place, not over 60 emails. Mm. Um, so it's a new wave of sales called buyer enablement. Um, and buyer enablement, the whole concept of that um, is that you make it as easy as possible for the buyer to buy. Yes. Um, and if you do that, you will make more sales. Um, and that's sort of the next generation of sales. Um, everyone's been focused on what's called sales enablement, which is your tools for like outreach and LinkedIn, sure. which makes salespeople more efficient. Yeah. But this focuses on the buyer. Um, and yeah, we, we built that. Uh, took about a year to actually build the MVP, did it very mm-hmm. quietly. Um, and then, yeah, launched it about a year and a half ago. Okay, cool. So this is second time founder mode, right? Mm -hmm. There's always a debate online, like second time founder, third time founder versus first time founder and and the differences and how you operate and the lessons learned. Tell me a little bit about second time founder, Nick, like what what are you doing differently to to first time founder? I think the the whole second time versus first time is, is nothing obvious. It's not like this tick list of, okay, well, I learned from this, now we're going to do this. I think it's more just a sort of slickness to the operation. Um, So we're much better at managing. We know the quality of employee we need to to make our vision happen. Um, We we know how to bring that together, bring the team together, uh, focus on a vision, focus on a strategy. We know um, not to get distracted. 
um, by things that aren't actually going to drive the business forward. We're very focused on revenue levers now. So, okay, what is going to drive revenue? Um, you know, if we're spending X, what is that going to drive revenue wise? Um, so it's all those sort of almost intangibles rather than, okay, let's use this, this tech stack. Let's build uh, the dev in this language, blah, 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 blah. It's very much more a slickness and confidence that, we've taken with us into this second one i guess what what do you wish if there is anything that you could i suppose tell first time founder nick if you can go back in time and you're you're working on design my night and then you appear in the room what what, what sage wisdom and, and knowledge are you dropping well i would have said do a reservation platform <laughs> <laughs> straight away <laughs> yeah, rather so than t- two and a half years later um i think it's the distraction element i think you can get pulled in so many different directions as a founder yeah um and you know i controversial it was not very controversial but you know even like networking events and all of that i see is very big at the moment which is great and it's good to find a sort of tribe and a community of other founders you can lean on if you don't have that but for me it's it's get your head down and bloody work like you know th- those three hours networking. What could you have done on your business at home instead? Um, and you know partnership opportunities and all of that sort of stuff that is essentially noise mm-hmm. around growing the business. You know you've really got to be good as a founder to 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 put a helmet on and block out all of that noise. Yeah. Um, and just focus on building the business. Put your ego aside. Yeah. I think a lot of founders now come into entrepreneurship driven by their ego. Sure. Um, so you got to put your ego aside. And just get your head down and work as hard as you've ever worked before. Yeah. And that is really what it takes, right? Because there seems to be a lot of um, commentary on online about how you want to grow a, a huge multi-million pound business, but you want to work four days a week or something. And and I, I think that's that's wonderful and that's a different conversation. But as an entrepreneur, is that possible? I, I, I don't know. I don't think it is. I think to get started at least. So, you know, the first two years. Yeah you have to give it absolutely everything you have to you have to give the startup the best opportunity of success and one element of that is focus and hard work yeah. um so yeah if you think it's something you can just switch on and switch off and work nine to five i've never seen a startup that i've worked with or invested in or a founder i respect that uh, took it easy for the first two or three years everyone i've spoken to that's been success worked as hard as i did on design my night yeah um, doesn't mean you have to pass that on to your team. Like, I don't expect our team to work like the founders do. But as founders, you need to be so incredibly driven and single minded. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I'm yet to be disproven of that. Yeah, I, I'm not going to disprove that. <laughs> I agree. Um, tell me a little bit about something that you said, just then, where you said you've got better at analyzing the quality of the employee. What? What what is a good employee in, in Nick's eyes? What what do you look for when hiring? You know, how do you build a world class team and, and culture? Yeah, it's a it's really tricky. Um, B uh, design my night. We only ever raised angel money, so we didn't have tons of cash to throw at uh, high uh, high demand employees. Um, so it was a very young team. Andrew and I spent a lot of time growing that team. Yeah, uh, we put a lot of our effort into coaching them, helping them, putting in processes with them, um, which was a huge success and something we're really proud of. And most of the the juniors that started design my night ended up as managers. Um, and then have gone on to great things as well, which I absolutely love. Um, but with Trumpet, trying to take a bit more of a different tact, um, and it's not necessarily spending more. Uh, it's spending a bit more to buy more experience, but it's not suddenly going and spending 200 grand on, yeah. you know, because someone's worked uh, gone to Harvard. Um, but you're looking for more self-starters, bit more self-assured bit more self-confident in their ability Mm. um the confidence to push us back as founders um we're very opinionated as founders we've got our ideas but i always say to everyone challenge me yeah that's not a problem that's good i want you to challenge me and more often than not you'll be right and i'll be like great um so it's more that they just get on they put in their own processes they've they've got a way to learn and develop probably more on like the processes and management side which is what we're here for um but in terms of their skill set that they're just a a bit more competent 
and have the confidence to, to go and do that and succeed. Hey, really quick video just to give you a free subscription to Coda Magazine. Coda is the number one publication for all the latest tech news, expert insights and exclusive industry interviews. With Coda, you get the inside scoop on what's happening with Elon Musk, with Bill Gates, with Jeff Bezos, with Mark Zuckerberg and so much more. So if you work in the technology industry, then I'd highly recommend that you give Coda a read today. Just scan the QR code on the screen for free access now, or go to welovealpha.com forward slash magazine to get your free subscription today. What about the flip side? What if you've hired somebody in your eyes, they tick all the boxes and then inevitably, you know, a certain percentage of people just don't work out. They don't gel with the culture. It's not quite right for them. How, how do you view firing, exiting, having people move on? What, what, what's your, I guess, perspective on that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tough, but you've got to be ruthless. Yeah. Um, I, th I think, again, that's um, something that founders are a bit too, I don't like this word, but a bit too weak on, maybe weak-minded on, is the thought yeah. of yeah. firing someone is horrific. They hate the concentration. Yeah, Co confrontation. confrontation. And it is yeah. horrific. Like, I don't enjoy firing someone, but you have to make those tough decisions, um, especially in early stage, if you've got someone that um, is potentially negative on the culture, especially, yep. um, that can spread like wildfire in a startup. You know, startup, everyone's working very hard, everyone's working fast pace, and they're doing that because they believe in the vision, in the startup, and in the founders. And if you've got someone sort of spreading negativity um, in a non-constructive way. Yeah, um, yeah. We always say to our team, come to us. Like if, if, if you're not happy with something or how you've been spoken to or the culture, just let, please let us know. Do not go and bitch about it behind our backs yeah. um, and, and spread negativity because we want to improve it. Um, so it is more sort of culture, rather, culture fit rather than skill that is more dangerous, I would say, at an early stage startup. Um, and we've got a third founder we brought in with us for Trumpet called Rory. And I think that's something, he's a first time founder, so that's something we've been coaching him on yeah. is how to deal with confrontation and how to deal with letting people go, which we've had to do. Um, and that that's just as important as hiring good people is letting go bad ones. Yeah, yeah. I mean, culture, there's, there's the old quote that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And if you have a great team, they're all motivated, they're all bought into the mission, they'll find a way to make it work, right? Regardless of what the, what the PowerPoint says. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is true to a certain extent. I think you need both. Um, I think they should be dining at the same table rather than yeah, eating yeah. each other. Um, you know, you, <laughs> can, like that. you can have a great culture, but a product that's just not going to work um, yeah. and then it won't work. But equally, as you say, you can have a great product, but with a bad team or culture and it probably won't work. Um, so, yeah, trying to find that right balance. And it's tough. Like times have changed now with remote working and flex working. You know, I was uh, uh, technically a dinosaur because we were pre-COVID. I wouldn't have hired anyone that couldn't have come to our office in Hoxton. Um, so times have changed. And the, the, this, this notion of office culture, mm. uh, this startup culture uh, has changed massively. And I think we're all still trying to get to grips with that. And I haven't found the right answer to that either yet. Neither have I, my friend. I, I went from running um, a team with my last big corporate role of 50 people across the UK and Ireland and India. And now I've got a team of people in the Philippines and, and Pakistan and Bangladesh who I've never met before. So yeah. it's, it's a very different new world, but one that I'm, um, that I'm up for. Uh, me and you did exactly the same thing. We went into big corporates. I spent five years with a, a big multinational recruitment company. You were with L'Oreal. L'Oreal, yeah. yeah. I think we both had the same realization, really, is that we, we climbed up that ladder and, and, you know, got more and more senior and then looked at the person above us and went, do I really want to be doing that in five years or whatever it's going to take? And for me, the answer was no. Yeah. Um, hence me leaving and, and starting my own company. Yeah. I think you pretty much did the same thing, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, uh, I, I loved my time at L'Oreal. It's a really fun, vibrant company, as you'd probably imagine. Um, I learned a ton. Um, I was fresh from uni, um, straight into L'Oreal. Yeah. Uh, give you a lot of responsibility there. Um, so I really enjoyed my time there. I've made some friends that I've got for life as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's that classic founder case of 
yeah, do you want to work for the machine? You know, and, and L'Oreal, I was, because it's my nature, I was working bloody hard. I was yeah. working weekends, I was working on holidays, but for the French owner making billions, not for my paycheck. <laughs> yes. Um, so I think I just had that realisation um, that, yeah, is this something I want to do? Interestingly, it's more Andrew, uh, my co-founder, who was more entrepreneurial. So, mm. you know, we, we were tight since sort of week one at university. Um, he was the one that was always talking about starting his own thing. Yeah. And actually, I'm more safe and secure in sort of my comfort bubble, which people would find a bit strange on what I've gone on to do. But, um, you know, part of me was thinking, OK, look, I can build a great, uh, career I can take a great salary I can probably move to Paris for a bit sure. um everything was looking great um so it was actually more him that was like let's let's do something let's do this you know do we want to be general managers he worked at Accenture so a lot more yeah. dry than uh, L'Oreal um so he was the one that actually sort of gave me the nudge and that's sort of been the theme of my life is people have given me a nudge and then I fully embraced it and and gone on and done it so he was the one that sort of gave me the nudge in terms of let, let's let's be founders am i right in saying that you just like randomly met at uni we like flatmates or something yeah we're in the same halls so we okay. actually play both like football so we were actually just playing football on the front of the halls on the same team and started chatting yeah. um and sort of hit it hit it off from there being sort of like close mates yeah since week one steve jobs says that or said rather that it's um really hard if not impossible to kind of connect those dots looking forward and you have to look backwards what what happens if you and Andrew never met do you think would you still be in corporate world would would there be no trumpet would there be no design my night would there be no horseplay ventures would there be no pitch deck probably not so uh, you know he's he's always sort of been the, the 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 one that drove me forward to be a founder um never say never but yeah i, I yeah, our lives would have been very different if we hadn't met each other on on lots of fronts. Um, so, yeah, I've never really thought about that to, to look back. Pr probably would have stayed in the corporate world yeah. and had a nicely successful career. Mm. What well, one thing that's very different about the corporate world to startup life is in the corporate world, you know, you don't have to worry about like raising money or anything unless you're an exec member of of the team and that's part of your job. Whereas with startup life, unless you're running like an agency or something that you can bootstrap, you if you, if you want to scale it and scale it quick, most of the time you need to raise some cash. You raised a little bit with Design My Night and I think you've raised slightly more with, with, with Trumpet. T tell me a little bit about the process of raising capital because you've obviously done this on both sides of the aisle now from getting money for your ventures and also giving it to uh, to other people. Yeah. Um, not something that I know a ton about I've always bootstrapped my stuff but to tell me a little bit more about the investing side I mean look a it's tough so yeah. similarly to being a founder like raising money um I don't think founders are ready for how hard it is um I did a few LinkedIn posts um when we raised our our VC round for Trumpet uh, which was the first time I'd raised VC money as well I'd invested alongside them but never raised um and I think people were flabbergasted of the, the amount of outreach that we had to do. A second time founders successfully mm. exited. It was a good idea in a huge space. Um, I can't remember the numbers, but I'd outreached hundreds to get the offers in that we did. And yeah. people are like, okay, well, if a second time successful founder has to speak to hundreds, yeah. the first time founder, unless you're in AI at the moment, probably has to speak to 500. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's yeah. a sales funnel. Um, if you think you're just going to reach out to three angels and close your round with those three angels, you're probably wrong. Yeah. Um, so it's incredibly tough. Um, it's a sales, it's a sales pitch. So whoever is leading it, which whichever founder is leading it, has to have the confidence to, to be selling the vision, selling the ideas, selling the team. Um, so yeah, you, you've, you've got to be ready to basically pitch. Um, you have to have a great deck. Uh, obviously, my, my podcast is around that. And because I see so many decks, um, yeah. it blows my mind how awful some are still. Um, so like the top, top um, advice I give to people around that is short, like 10, 11 slides, not lots of words, um, very clear structure tell what the actual problem is, tell what the solution is, tell how you're going to solve it, tell what your revenue is, who are the team. Um, that's all you really need mm -hmm. at that stage. Um, you know, I see these like theses over like... The, and, <laughs> White and, papers. Yeah, and if you're, yeah. if you, if you know, we're receiving 50, 60, 70 decks a week 
Um, and on average, an, uh, an, an investor spends 90 seconds yeah. on the first look of a deck. So I always say to a founder, open up your deck and see how far you get in 90 seconds. Yeah. Um, so um, there's loads of tips out there. But, you know, and, and the final thing on that is design. Like yes, 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 we've yes. got tools like Canva now. Even PowerPoint has some templates that don't look awful, yeah. um, but I still get decks that look terrible. Yeah. Um, and even if it's a great idea, I won't carry on reading it if I open it and it just looks yeah. like it was designed in the nineties. So, um, yeah, there, there's there's lots of tips out there. Um, you know, go onto Canva and look at one of their templates for for raising money. Um, but yeah, it's 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 going to take up most of your time, and you've got to treat it like a sales funnel. Um, and fill your top end of your funnel. Um, be very organized. Build your own mini CRM or Google Doc about who you're speaking to, who you approach, what stage you're at, um, and then you follow that sales process, hopefully, to close. But also bearing in mind, most people will never raise money. Yeah. Um, and that's just a reality, unfortunately. I, I completely agree around the design side. W with my recruiting company, we get over a thousand CVs a week of, of different software developers, right? And it just blows me away how little care somebody will put into their personal presentation of, of themselves. So it's, yeah. a, it's a CV pitch deck, slightly different, but kind of the same. You're, you're, yeah. you're trying to sell a story yourself. and and why, why somebody should make a decision about you in a business sense. Um, and Canva's a great, I've had um, heads of technology from Canva on the podcast before a couple of times. And it's a, I use that platform. I'm a Canva pro <laughs> user. It's a, it's a great tool. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm been in marketing my whole life and, you know, to have that back in the day would have been amazing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Canva's a, an, an amazing tool. And funny you say about presenting yourself. We, I've recently did a post actually bemoaning that I would say 70% of the, recent applications we've had for trumpet roles um were written by chat gpt yeah yeah um and that was the question why do you want to work for trumpet which i don't want a long paragraph mm. i just want some passion some some creativity some drive on why why you like us and why we're gonna like you and they've just put it into chat gpt and yeah. if that happens i put that straight in the bin oh me too if the answer is as a large language model, I cannot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, that would be an instant no. Um, and it shows people don't care. Um, you you mentioned around LinkedIn posts and, and social media a couple of times there. So um, you've got a great brand and I hate the word on a personal brand, but you've got this great online following, I guess I don't really know what else to call it, around marketing, around being a founder, around building something cool. There's a lot of people trying to do that now. Where are people going wrong? Where, where are people going right? What, what what kind of works? What Every platform is obviously different, but perhaps talk about the ones that you're most known on. H how do you scale and, and build a personal brand? Yeah, so Gr I... Cringe. Yeah, <laughs> cringe. Yeah, first, uh, yeah, I never sat down and thought I'm going to build a personal brand, but yeah. um, so I, I only post on LinkedIn, um, both professionally and privately. I don't have any other social media in my private life. Yeah. Uh, it's just... I think it's the ills of society. I, d I don't just want to look at social media. It does me no good. Um, so, yeah, I'm very focused on LinkedIn. Um, I think the, the the two tips are authenticity and consistency. Yeah. It's probably the same with most social media. Um, well, maybe not authenticity on Instagram and stuff, but no, um, the, opposite. <laughs> the opposite. So... I, I just I, I started posting when I sold Design My Night, um, and just because I saw just a lot of crap on LinkedIn of of, of people p acting like they're the experts but have never done it, so giving advice, never done it. Um, and as soon as I sold Design My Night, I went straight into mentoring, joined lots of mentorship programs, helping different types of founders from different communities. Like, I love that. Um, so I just wanted to put all that advice more into the the public ether, um, and just giving real just real life stories uh, or and advice um, and tips, um, not curated. Like people think, oh, I've got a, like a VA writing my posts or do you have this huge schedule for your LinkedIn? Literally, I will wake up that morning and just think of a little topic to, to sure. write about and just tap it out. And there'll sometimes be spelling mistakes, there'll sometimes be errors. But I think that's my authenticity. Like you won't go on and see a curated picture of me looking wistfully out of a window and sure, then sure. doing a tip um 
on top of that. And I think that's that's why it's grown well because I think people resonate with me. They know it's me writing it. Uh, they can engage with me. I'll always answer questions as well. Um, so yeah, I think they're they're the two. Like think really think what you can offer to the world and whatever stage of the career you're at there'll be a tribe out there so actually if you're a founder that's just starting out write write about that real journey don't write like you're an expert because you're not but write about the real journey the ups and downs and then you'll get other founders that will see your authenticity and that's how you build your community fortunately me i'm obviously writing about investing and running startups so i get sort of both communities coming mm. coming to me um but yeah just just write from the heart and be open and honest um and you 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 will find that tribe eventually i think it was gary vaynerchuk that claimed the words document don't create so i guess he's saying it's like document the journey yeah is the easiest way rather than writing about something which you don't know anything about and just pretending yeah just talk about where you're at and what the biggest challenge is that you're working on and, and people will buy into that. People, people will want to follow that journey. Like the whole building in public thing, there's a reason why it's so interesting to follow because it's like, you can relate to it. And it yeah. goes, it goes back to what you said about being authentic, genuine. Yeah. Right? Cause in a, in a world of LinkedIn or Instagram where it's fakery everywhere that you see, yeah. if you can even be just a little bit genuine, yeah. it's like being a, a purple cow. Is that, that, that great marketing term, right? Yeah. Um, do you know what I'm saying by that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, you and I think that that's what, you know, the, the DMs I get are like, oh, thank you. Like you're very honest and you yeah. just give real tips that we can learn from. It's not just fluff. You know, a lot of the bigger stars uh, who, who might be on channels like LinkedIn just write these sort of, you know, hooty fluty top tips that you can Google off the internet, um, which doesn't really help anyone. Whenever I try and put content out there, um, unless it's sort of promoting anything I'm working on, it's uh, it, anyone reading this, can they take at least one tip from this post? Um, if they can take 10 tips, great. But can just someone reading this take one thing that can help them? Because um, that's why I'm doing it is to just help other founders um, be more successful uh, and learning from what I've done. Um, so that that is sort of my mantra in anything I put out. Same on the podcast. It's um, whenever I'm in your seat thinking of what questions to ask and where I'm going to move the conversation, mm -hmm. it's, okay, at least one thing is a listener going to take from from this that they can apply to their own journey. Yeah. Okay. Um, somebody else who is killing the the LinkedIn game, in, in my opinion, and is doing really well and comes from a place of authenticity is, is Roy Samuel. I think you've been on his podcast mm -hmm. a year ago. He's coming on mine next week, actually. Small world. Lovely guy. Yep. Lovely guy. Yeah. Um, you mentioned on his pod that you were really, really bad at math. Mm -hmm. Me too. Um, <laughs> I think it's actually more common for founders than, than you'd realize. Yeah. Um, and it, it before I started a business, I was like, Oh, I need to know everything about gross profit and margins and all of this stuff. And you don't really, you, you need to have a very high level understanding. And then for me, it's more about building a product and, and selling it and getting it out there to people. And, and, and that, that's how I've done it anyway. Maybe that's wrong, but that, that's, that's been my <laughs> approach. Um, I, I found that math was something in you know, like the accounting side was something that I was able to delegate. Right. Mm -hmm. But there are definitely things as a founder that you cannot delegate. Mm -hmm. Okay. What, what, what do you think they are in, in your eyes? I guess another way of asking that question would be like, what do you do like all, all day? Yeah. Like, cause if you're not doing math, right? Yeah, what, definitely what, what, not doing math. <laughs> neither am I. What, yeah. what are you doing, Nick? So I think, um, you know, founders in, in the sort of first two, three years uh, should A, be focused on, well, look, it depends what type of founder you are. So if you're a technical founder, you're obviously, you should be in the weeds building the product mm -hmm. and strategizing with, maybe a co-founder on, on product direction. Um, again, if you're a technical founder, there's no reason why you can't be speaking to customers, uh, learning from them, getting their feedback. Um, so I think the, the theme is you still got to be rolling your sleeves up and, and getting in on the weeds um, while at the same time, always thinking about strategy and what's working, what's not questioning everything you're doing, um, looking at the performance of everything across the business. So we're constantly analyzing 
um, our customer su success, um, our upselling, our churn, our marketing, the different marketing channels, sales, who our ICP is, uh, what is our sales process. So all of these things, I think, are up to the founders initially to be analyzing, challenging and changing. Um, and then once you find some sort of sweet spot, you then obviously are bringing in talent to take on those processes, and keep it moving forward. Um, I think you should, you then also have your own skill as a founder. So like my skill, I should say, is marketing yeah. and sales. That's sort of what I do. So I am doing sales every day for Trumpet. Mm. Um, and I also sort of look after the marketing with our marketing lead. Um, so again, that's all the things that, that you need to do for marketing. Whereas Andrew is lo more looking at the, the data, the CS, the operations, um, and that side of things. And, and Rory is incredible at sales. Um, so he's very focused on our sales processes and defining our ICP and constantly tweaking that side of the thing. So it's a mixture of being in the weeds, um, but then also being able to pull yourself out of the weeds and see the state of the business and, you know, are you traveling in the right direction? It's the uh, sort of cliche, but you're sort of steering the ship. So, like, you know, what destination do you want to get to as founders? Is that a lifestyle business? Is that VC money? Is that a, a re uh, exiting for 5 million? Is it exiting for 500 million? Whatever your destination is as a ship, is up to the founders to be steering that ship mm. while also making sure the passengers in the ship are happy and the engines are running. But you need to be up in that wheelhouse making sure you're directing the ship in the right direction. Yeah. Okay. So it's vision. It's communicating that to the troops. Yeah. And you can't do everything. So inspiring them, training them, making sure they're competent, intelligent, and, and care about the purpose. And and that way the ship's going in one direction rather than loads of little speedboats flying off and there's pirate wars and everything happening <laughs> which can happen so you know, will, will happen yeah the team yeah. can can be going off in their own directions uh, another founder can be going off in a different direction you can have different exit ideas different strategy ideas uh, and you'll you'll eventually become unstuck if that happens yeah. um so design my night was as tight a ship as you could ever have had um uh, in terms of all of that uh, so that when you say actually what do you learn as a first time founder to a second time founder i think that's something very clear that andrew and i thought about was how can we build that tight ship mm. with everything to point us constantly in the same direction this is going to sound a little bit weird but um my my missus has uh, she can speak like five languages or something right and i know that you studied Sp portuguese. spanish and portuguese and yeah, yeah yeah at uni um in in i i can see how that's helped her well, it helped her with a PhD and it certainly helped her with, with um, various aspects of, of our startup. Mm -hmm. Did that help you in the business world? And I know it's not like, it, it seems like one of those questions where it's like languages helps you in business, but I, I can point to a couple of very, very concrete examples about how it has in, in our situation. Yeah. Did you waste a couple of years or did that help you? No, I think I, A, I adore languages. So uh, I did those two, but I speak another three or four as well. It's, it's something I, I pick up very easily so you're mm. saying i'm terrible at math i was terrible at science but languages i can just learn my, my brain just works with languages um you say you know most fans are terrible at math that's probably you know the creative side of our brains are the ones that work which is probably more where founders lie unless you're sort of an engineer yeah. um so for me the, the beauty of languages is less the language itself and more confidence um to make a fool out of yourself if you're going to learn a language you're gonna you have to speak that language and you have to go and say the wrong things you have to start a conversation with someone and not understand what they're saying back to you and not be embarrassed so everyone that i see have learned languages has this sort of inner confidence yeah. which is sort of priceless i think when you're when you're a founder um it also just gives you tons of different skills like a language degree is only 20 percent learning the language you know then for my degree spanish and portuguese i was learning about south american and spanish culture i was learning about south american and portuguese history i was doing literature yeah um so you're actually getting a very well-rounded degree yeah um, it really helps your communication style. I think I've got a very good sensitivity to communication. Um, I think I can set the right tone when communicating with someone I'm selling to versus the team versus a difficult period we might be going through. 
Um, and that communication, for me, I think I learned when learning languages. Mm. Um, so I think it makes you a much more sensitive person in touch with humanity rather than uh, the sort of maths and sciences, which are much more pragmatic. Yeah, which I would argue, and it's a hill I'd probably die on, really, is that the ability to effectively communicate and convince somebody to agree genuinely with your point of view, whether that's looking to sell something, looking to raise investment, looking to hire somebody, looking to date somebody, whatever. I would argue that is the most important skill, period. Yeah, I would agree. I think communication and selling. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, and, and you are doing that all day long, whether you realize or you're not. Um, and, and that's one thing I'll always say to founders when I meet them or if they want investment is, are you out selling? Mm. Are you out there making a fool out of yourself, getting told no, getting the door slammed in your face, getting wins, getting excited by the wins, learning, listening to feedback from your customers, listening to the ones that tell you your product's crap, listen to the ones that tell you your product's great. Are you out there doing all of that? And if you're not, then you're, that's, you're the wrong founder, in my opinion. And that all comes down to communication and sales. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's only really kind of um, three paths. It's it's those that are too scared to even begin that journey. There, were, there are those people that go on that journey. They hear all the no's. They face all the rejection. Elon Musk said that started a, starting a company is like uh, chewing glass and staring into the abyss. Okay, a bit of a dramatic way of saying it. But that's what he's describing, all the, all the no's, all the failure. And then you've got the third, and then they give up. And then the third type of people, they just experience all that pain and they keep going. Yeah. Right? And that's kind of you know, where, where, where someone like you are. You, you, you like the pain for, yeah, some, for it, some reason. It is a very sort of sadomasochistic thing being a founder. Like, it's, it's true. It's, but, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's mental, torture. physical, emotional torture. Yeah. Um, it's not all fun and games at all. Uh, and it's that sort of stuff that has to drive you. Yeah. Um, I think I've got this drive to succeed. Yeah. So everything I want to do, um, you know, it's not just it's not just a competitive nature. It's, it's wanting to succeed, setting my own standard and wanting to hit that standard. And I have that with everything I do. Um, and I think that is my body armor. Um, to face all of the, the crap that comes your way. Cool. Well, if there ever was a, a time to finish this, I think that's <laughs> a great a great point. Okay. Thank you, mate, for, for coming on. It was great to get your perspectives. I feel like this is like a master class on starting a company and, and, and that sort of thing. So um, hopefully people found value from it. Um, we plugged your world as we went along, but if there's one place people should go right now that, that are still watching and listening, what, what, where is that? Yeah, just just go to find me on LinkedIn, uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, um, and yeah, that that's that's where I sort of share everything we're up to, share all the new businesses I'm working on, my investments, and hopefully advice that people can take from it as well. Cool, awesome. Well, thank you, my friend. Thank you very much. Thank you. See you all next week or right now. Click the next episode. Bye bye. Hey, thanks for watching this podcast. Make sure that you like, subscribe, follow, comment, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and I'll see you in the next episode.